And this is Carlton Television for London. Now with the time at 10 o'clock, it's over to the studios of ITN for the news. From the headquarters of ITN, News at 10 with Trevor McDonald. British tourists killed in the holiday helicopter crash. Europe tells Major, don't blackmail us over voting. Under fire, the frightening legacy of TV crime shows. And a sparkling return, the crown jewels as you've never seen them before. Good evening. Six British tourists sightseeing in Transylvania in Romania were killed today when their helicopter fell out of the sky and onto a mountainside. Five were from one family from Bristol. The head of the family didn't go on the trip. He stayed behind to look after his baby great-grandson. The party had hired the helicopter to see the castle where the legendary Count Dracula is said to have lived. Their pilot was also killed. James Bays at ITN reports. Local people near the village of Poina Brazov say the helicopter was about 100 metres up when it fell out of the sky like a stone. The Britons, five from the same Bristol family and a close friend, were flying back to their hotel after a 15-minute tour around Dracula country when tragedy struck. The pilot, a local man, was also killed instantly. These pictures, taken by a holidaymaker last year, show one of his firm's regular trips over the ski resort and around a local landmark known as Dracula's Castle using a French-designed Romanian-built helicopter. The tour operator says two other members of the family, the grandfather and the 11-month-old baby grandson, did not take today's helicopter ride. He says he's now arranging to bring them back home. The relatives um, are um, obviously very, very distressed. Um, uh, our head rep, um, it, it's the, here's the person that I spoke to, um, said that um, uh, they're very much like to, to come back home. Um, and that's what we're trying to do now. Tonight, one of the victims was named as 22-year-old Jason Norton. He was the boyfriend of the daughter of Bristol couple, Derek and Janet Smith, who also died. Their neighbours are devastated. It's a great tragedy that, um, you know, for them all to have died in one accident is terrible. The Romanian authorities are tonight scouring the crash site looking for clues to the cause of the tragedy while British embassy officials comfort the bereaved grandfather. The Foreign Minister of Greece accused Mr Major of blackmail today in the deadlock over Britain's voting strength in an enlarged European Union. Theodoros Pangalos will chair the next meeting on Saturday at which there will be an attempt to break the deadlock. Today he called the quarrel petty and said the majority won't let the minority, Britain and Spain, win. Our political editor, Michael Brunson, reports. These are the sights and sounds which give Tory Eurosceptics in Britain a very bad attack of the vapours. The European anthem ringing out over a conference about Europe's federalist future in Brussels today. A conference which also heard the Greek foreign minister, who will chair the very meeting this weekend, which is supposed to find solutions, talk about other countries' absolute determination to resist the blackmail of a tiny minority. Mr Pangos telling ITN later of the, quote, chaos and major crisis, which will follow if Britain maintains its stand this weekend. What if they insist on it still being 20 We'll be in a major crisis. The union will stop to, uh, will cease to function and uh, it's against the fundamental interests of the British people. In London, the Prime Minister, leaving by the number 10 back door, talked of trying to find a balanced solution, though Downing Street denied he was backing any particular compromise. As to what we'll actually settle for, he simply said... I believe we are right to argue vigorously for principles that are important both for Britain and for Europe's future, and that is what we are doing. We need, Madam Speaker, a balanced decision which safeguards the rights of minorities. That talk of a balanced solution raising some eyebrows among the no-surrender-on-Europe tendency among the Tories, the sort of reaction which doesn't make Douglas Hurd's job any easier. Cabinet today told him to carry on the good work and some fresh British ideas have been put into the negotiating pot. But during heated Commons exchanges, John Smith talked of confusion as Mr Major tried to please both his pro and anti-Europeans. Why is he, as usual, seeking to face both ways? 
If anyone had the faintest idea where the right honourable gentleman was on this question, he might be entitled to ask that. And later, Paddy Ashdown added his attack. We have a Prime Minister who seems yet again to be running this country on the basis of what is right for a small section of the Conservative Party instead of what is right for the long-term interests of Britain. But the Prime Minister rejects that, and Douglas Hurd will explain why in a speech to the Conservative Central Council tomorrow afternoon. Michael Brunson, News at 10, Westminster. The Attorney General, Sir Nicholas Lyle, defended his role in the Arms to Iraq affair today, insisting that he'd acted with the utmost integrity. At the heart of much of his testimony to the Scott inquiry was whether or not he'd put pressure on ministers to sign so-called gagging orders. The orders can prevent evidence being seen by defence lawyers and can, therefore, seriously affect the outcome of a trial. In this case, it was the Matrix-Churchill trial, when three businessmen were charged with illegally exporting arms equipment to Iraq. ITN's Kevin Dunn explained the day's twists and turns. Sir Nicholas Lyle began the day in courteous and confident good humour. I'm, I'm looking forward to the chance to have my say. His mood hardly that of a man fighting for his political life. He'd been called to the inquiry to explain why, as Attorney General, he prosecuted businessmen for helping to arm Iraq, even though the government appears to have encouraged the trade. Sir Nicholas began with a robust defence of his conduct. He insisted he was right to tell ministers they had a duty to sign so-called gagging orders. But under persistent questioning by Lord Justice Scott, his arguments faltered, and he appeared to concede that a minister could, in certain cases, refuse to sign. Pressing him about the dilemma facing a minister, the judge said, he happens not to agree with the advice he has, he thinks it's a clear case. In that case, conscientious refusal to sign could apply. Sir Nicholas, yes it could do. But no sooner was that reported than Sir Nicholas rushed out a statement. I've always taken the view that there are exceptional cases. This is no concession. But the opposition smelt signs of a significant admission. If you've got the responsibility for taking the decision, you must have the right to say no as well as the right to say yes. Ministers have now got to explain why they signed up and said yes rather than saying no. In the Commons, John Major rallied to his attorney and defended the system of ministers claiming public interest immunity. Let me read to the House what my right honourable friend, the attorney, said in his opening statement to the inquiry this morning. And I quote, where documents or information fall into a class that has been recognised by the courts as attracting public interest immunity, the relevant minister is under a duty to make a claim. Sir Nicholas left the inquiry then with a public show of support from the Prime Minister but with his political and legal judgment seriously called into question and his career still in jeopardy. The Attorney General's performance so far has done nothing to dispel the clouds over his political future and he faces another difficult day's cross-examination tomorrow. Kevin Dunn, News at 10 at the Scott Inquiry. For almost as long as there's been television, there's been crime on television as far back as Dixon of Doc Green. But today the head of Channel 4, Michael Grade, said broadcasters should start thinking twice about showing programmes which reconstruct real-life crimes. He said they made viewers afraid of crime. Colin Baker heard the arguments. Death Wish director Michael Winner probably knows as much as anyone else in Hollywood about movie violence. But it's not his work on the big screen that's upset the head of Channel 4, rather his interpretation of true crime stories made by London Weekend Television. Claiming the programmes increase the public's fear of crime, rather than reassure them, Michael Grade called them irresponsible. The boundaries between reality and fiction are blurred. Terrifying crimes reconstructed in graphic detail are sensationally presented in a glossy produ production, out of context, or out of context for maximum effect, and sadly, unwittingly, maximum fear. Michael Grade, late in life, has gone from libertarian to Mary Whitehouse clone, and it ill fits him, and it's not a position he can be proud of. Crime programmes, whether of the Morse, the Bill, or True Crimes variety, attract large audiences. The BBC's Crime Watch, criticised as voyeuristic, is watched by 11.5 million, in suspicious circumstances by just under 11 million, and Michael Winner's True Crimes by 9.5 million. Television has to present items that happen in society. Some of them are nice, some of them are not nice. That is the role of television, not to be a nanny 
or a sensor. I just was issuing a, what I would call a sort of warning shot across the bowers of, uh, of, of program makers not to slip into the kind of American exploitation of real life crime. Broadcasters were also warned that crime reporting was always possible without adding to the public's fears. Colin Baker, News at 10, Central London. The crisis developing in the Far East took a dangerous turn today with a statement from Communist North Korea. It said it would regard any economic sanctions over its refusal to let the outside world into its nuclear secrets as a declaration of war. America is sending Patriot air defense missiles to South Korea and as our diplomatic editor James Mates reports, the military temperature is rising. The military tension is growing with every passing day. The South Korean Navy staged high-profile maneuvers off the country's east coast today. Its army has been put on a higher state of alert. To the north of the demilitarized zone that divides the Korean peninsula, the North Korean army is also reported to be at an increased state of readiness. One report from the capital Pyongyang says that its highly regimented citizens have been told to prepare for war which adds menace to a radio broadcast from the north today, monitored by the BBC. It said, we will regard any US sanctions as a declaration of war against us, and will strongly deal with it. We mean what we say. Washington is showing no signs of backing down. Patriot missiles that were used to intercept Scud missiles in the Gulf War are being prepared for dispatch to South Korea, as are new deployments of US troops. Sanctions against the North are exactly what the U.S. has in mind if it continues with its secret nuclear program. The blood-curdling threats issued today are being taken seriously. It's uh, not that unusual for the North to be heard giving threatening uh, rhetorical blasts to the South. But this time I think there was uh, a little more than usual, the vehemence and the threatening tone. So people have taken it seriously. South Korea's president, Kim Young sam expressed the fears of many today when he said that in this atmosphere, war could start by accident. And yet he's still determined that joint military exercises with the United States should go ahead, however provocative the North might find them. To the South Koreans, it seems that risking war now is better than living in the future with a nuclear regime on their doorstep. Still ahead on News at 10 tonight, the tobacco company, the TV station, and now a lawsuit for billions of pounds. One way to see one's crown jewels and the way the rest of us might see them in their new home. And a surprise tonight for the sport where Britain does well. Why the top man says it's time to go. There's no point in banging your head against the brick wall. Um, I felt there was no place in the sport for me and that's it. Into a world where convention rules comes a new challenger that dares to be different from the herd. You can go your own way. The probe. New from Ford. You can go your own way. It doesn't matter what the others say. Go your own way. Dingles, Jollies, Frasers, Arnott's, D.H. Evans, Bins, Dickens and Jones. Rackham's, Hammond's, Army and Navy. Schofields, Cavendish House, Barker's, Kendall's, Howell's, David Evans, House of Fraser, a house with 17 stories and 56 stores. With this amazing new swish curtain track, I can open and close my curtains from here, from here, 
from here. And from here, because not only does the Swish Curtain Track have a remote control, it also has a built-in programmable timer. So you can open and close your curtains even when you're out. It's called Autoglide and there's nothing else quite like it. Now that is what I call Swish. Cargo Club sells a vast range of top brands at warehouse prices. Come and join us and you'll see why our members are laughing all the way to the bank. Trot down to Cargo Club, Hurley Way, Croydon. Introducing Dulux Roller Coaster, a new brilliant white emulsion that rolls straight from the tub. It's much easier and quicker to apply because it's specially formulated for rollers. And there's virtually no splattering. The result, a quality Dulux finish in no time. Well, what do you think? It's great. But you missed a bit. Dulux Roller Coaster makes the difference. The world's largest tobacco company, Philip Morris, is suing the American television network ABC for more than six billion pounds over its allegations that the company put extra nicotine in cigarettes to keep smokers hooked. Philip Morris says the claims were not true. ABC says it stands by its reporting on the issue. Our Washington correspondent, Bill Neely, has the details. This is day one. The tobacco manufacturer's lawsuit, one of the biggest libel claims ever, challenges an American TV documentary. In it, say Philip Morris, the ABC network suggests that they artificially spike their cigarettes with nicotine to keep people smoking. Not true, say Philip Morris. If you look at the levels of nicotine in our products over the past several years, there has been a reduction across the board. ABC says it stands by its reporting on the issue, Philip Morris made clear it won't stand by amid a rising tide of anti-smoking sentiment. The hysteria surrounding the issue of, of tobacco uh, makes people think that we are fair game for anything that people want to say about us, even though it is clearly untrue and defamatory. This lawsuit comes as the tobacco industry fights for its survival, because the U.S. government is considering designating nicotine as a drug a move that could take most tobacco products off America's shelves. Congress has just voted to add the equivalent of 80 pence to a packet of cigarettes to help pay for health care reform. In many cities, people are banned from smoking in public buildings and restaurants. The anti-smoking campaign is at full steam. Forget about all that. Cancer, heart disease, emphysema, stroke stuff. Gentlemen, <laughs> we're not in this business for our health. <laughs> Philip Morris, a pioneer in cigarette making and now the largest tobacco company in America, say the ABC program caused their shares to decline. Their lawsuit demands three billion pounds compensation for this and another three billion in punitive damages. Phil Neely, News at 10, Washington. The government put in a word today for the older worker. It said employers shouldn't discriminate and shouldn't even ask the job applicant's age. But if you are over, say, 40, are you over the hill and unemployable? Or are you more mature and reliable? Adrian Britton has this report from the Midlands. When Jean Bladen reached the age of 60, she was surprised not to be asked to retire but continue working part-time for the Sainsbury supermarket chain, a company which actively recruits older people. Nearly one in ten of the workforce are aged over 55. But for Peter Kane, redundancy at the age of 50 meant many companies considering him too old for employment. You're 50 and you don't really expect to get a job, which is wrong really because um, I'm quite fit, active and reasonably intelligent. So-called ageism is a growing problem which until today hasn't been seriously addressed. Three out of ten people in Britain are over 50. Four out of ten employers admit discriminating against older workers. The government says it's untrue older workers are less fit and healthy, but it describes American laws which prevent age discrimination as unworkable. 
Instead, the government wants to persuade companies not to ask job applicants their age. Jeanette Bowen discovered even 44 was too old for 30 companies she previously applied to work for. Definitely got a more mature attitude towards the position. Um, a wide variety of people can relate better, I think, to an older person. I think companies quite uh, wrongly think that younger people are cheaper, when in fact the older person would be more than happy to take that job at that salary given the opportunity. But while describing the campaign to abolish age limits as a priority, the government admits civil service job applicants still have to give their date of birth. Adrian Britton, News at 10, The Midlands. The government has suffered another defeat in the House of Lords on its controversial plans for police reforms. A majority of 26 pairs backed an amendment allowing the government to abolish only one of two senior ranks ministers were planning to axe. It's the latest in a series of defeats to the Police and Magistrates Courts Bill, which affects police pay, ranks and conditions. In another hour about sex education, a sex handbook published by the government-funded Health Education Authority was withdrawn from sale today. The Health Minister, Brian Marwini, said the booklet was distasteful and smutty. And the comedy songwriter Donald Swan, famous for his partnership with Michael Flanders, has died. Their most famous song was Mud, Glorious Mud. The crown jewels went on display today in a new jewel house in the Tower of London opened by the Queen. It will have room for more visitors and it will give them stunning views through bulletproof glass. Norman Rees went behind the scenes for this special report on the jewels, their history and their new home. I am delighted to be here today on a visit which recalls for me my own coronation day. The crown jewels must surely be among the most dramatic and visible signs we have of our history and they are appropriately housed here in this historic palace. This priceless collection used to be displayed in a cramped underground bunker. Its new home, the ground floor of the tower's Waterloo barracks. What we've tried to create here is a repository, a place of safekeeping for the nation's treasures. We didn't want to make an exhibition about the crown jewels. We wanted to show them secure in a, in a treasury, kept safe here at the Tower of London, just as they've been for hundreds and hundreds of years. But equally, the public has to be able to get in to see them, and to see them properly. And here in the new jewel house, look, I can get within perhaps 12 or 14 inches of this orb, whereas in the old one, you were maybe four or five feet behind the plate glass. And we've also taken great care to light them very beautifully using fiber optic technology, lit from below with the fiber optics coming up through the cushion as well as from above. The tower has served as royal treasury since the 14th century. Come in. But it's housed men at arms since William the Conqueror. General Christopher Tyler lives here. The safety of the jewels is his responsibility. I don't lose any sleep about the Hollywood films of the crown jewels being stolen. I'm not complacent about uh, terrorism. That is the biggest threat. But the straight physical security is extremely good. In fact, there's only one man outside of the royal family who's allowed to lay a finger on them. Crown jeweler David Thomas. He says the skill of the men who created this historical collection is unmatched. The craftsmanship, the workmanship is absolutely superb. It, to me, it's a great, as I said, a great honor. And I feel very proud to be able to hold this history in my hand. It's everybody's history. It's everybody's heritage. They may look breathtaking, but the way the crown jewels have been displayed in the past has often disappointed visitors. Now, alongside the jewels, audio-visual technology will remind the paying public that they're not just ornaments. They're the real symbols of a living monarchy. A moving walkway will smooth the flow at peak periods when the jewel house will handle nearly 3,000 visitors an hour. There was no rush today, though, for the Queen, as she relived memories of her coronation. She last saw most of these jewels in 1967, when she opened the old display at the tower. 
Today, perhaps, a moment to reflect on a few things that haven't changed since she took the throne 41 years ago. There was a shock for the athletics world today with the surprise resignation of Frank Dick, the coach behind much of Britain's athletic success over the past 20 years. He said he was going with great regret and attacked what he called draconian cuts to his coaching budget. He added he wasn't prepared to oversee the demise of the successful system he'd helped to set up. Our sports correspondent Peter Staunton reports. For Britain's athletics team, another glittering event. Five gold medals at the recent European Indoor Championships. Two of them came from Colin Jackson. One was a world record. But while cricket and football have struggled to keep pace at international level, British athletes have almost made medal winning a formality. But today the man who helped transform the sport walked out on athletics, depressed by what he described as lack of organisation and lack of financial incentive, both for him and the whole coaching structure. Coaches and coaching are not given the kind of value that I think they deserve. And at that point, there's no point in banging your head against the brick wall. Um, I felt there was no place in the sport for me. Frank Dick has spent almost 25 years making Britain a world power in the sport. He was Daley Thompson's personal coach. When his career was terminated by injury, Frank Dick was there to help him off the track and into retirement. Right, my shoulder's good. My shoulder feels fine. But she needs the help of the crowd. She's certainly getting it. Since then, Sally Gunnell and Linford Christie have spearheaded the British effort. But if there are cutbacks in the coaching budget, the British effort may run out of steam. The Russians will continue to get stronger than the Ukrainians. If we don't support our coaches and their job, you're right, things will go backwards because these other Tigers are going to get stronger by the year. Frank Dick's departure has confirmed that one of the few successful areas in British sport could be heading for troubled times. And finally, Princes William and Harry began another skiing holiday today. This time it was with their mother, not their father, and in Lech in Austria and not Klosters, like last month. The two boys left mum behind and took the ski lift on either side of their instructor. The princess followed with two friends, but without a bodyguard in sight. There was just a glimpse of Prince Harry. Then the princess found herself left behind again as the two boys disappeared into the distance. And that's news at 10 tonight. We're back tomorrow. From all of us here at ITN, good night. Hello, good evening. Friday tomorrow and then the weekend, at least the first half of which looks quite fine. Some sunshine to look forward to on Saturday before the rain comes back on Sunday. The weather for the next 24 hours is fairly complicated though. There's a lot of low cloud and drizzly rain spreading up from the southwest. So much of England and Wales is going to end up overcast tonight with some patchy rain, most of it in the west. Further north across Scotland, it's scattered showers, especially in the far northwest, with the eastern side of Scotland more sheltered, but seeing the lowest temperatures, perhaps even a touch of frost there. On to tomorrow, it still starts with quite a mixture, a lot of cloud around, some fairly heavy showers across Scotland, more patchy rain across England and Wales. But things will improve during the day, the showers become less frequent in the north, and most of the rain will slip away to the south from England and Wales. So things brightening up during the afternoon, but staying rather breezy. Let's look ahead to the weekend now, though. Saturday is certainly the best day. A dry day with lots of sunshine around. A cold start, but temperatures probably up to around 11 during the afternoon. You can see the rain beginning to come into the west late on Saturday, and that's going to cross all parts of Britain during Sunday. So a changeable scene. Saturday is the day for sunshine. Here's a summary. I hope you can find it in your hearts to give me the time and space that has been lacking in recent years. That was the appeal, but this is the reality. Tomorrow on GMTV, can Diana, Princess of Wales, ever be free?
Next tonight, a roundup of the news from the Carlton region in London tonight, followed by the weather forecast. Then we continue the movie premiere, Presumed Innocent. Are you busy, Henry? Oh, no. Yes. Yeah. Run Sarah home for me. You think you have the time to spend an evening with me? And if we go someplace to dance, I know that there's a chance you won't be leaving with me. And afterwards we drop into a quiet little place and have a drink or two. What kept you? And then I go and spoil it all by saying... The Citroen Xantia. Discover what Citroen can do for you. Who in London's got eight times more products than even a B&Q Superstore and low warehouse prices? The new B&Q Warehouse Croydon, worth going that bit further for. There is only one chocolate that feels like silk. experience is silk. The chocolate is galaxy. With rock bottom prices throughout the store, you can count on lots of change at Quick Save. Ready then? For Sky's 30 day free home trial. Yes, it's on now. 20 channels of music, movies, sport, kids' TV. Something for me? Yeah, something for everyone. The Sky Free Home Trial. See your participating TV retailer or cable operator for free equipment and installation with no obligation. Great move. What, the lift? No, getting Sky. Remagel has exploded the idea that an effective indigestion tablet should leave a chalky, gritty taste behind. Remagel brings you fast, effective relief, but in a soft, chewy tablet. Now there's new fresh mint Remagel. Just as effective, just as soft and chewy. Remagel. Effective indigestion relief that's chewy, not chalky. Eyes down for live TV bingo with the mirror. There's £100,000 to be won instantly tomorrow. Get your £100,000 live TV bingo card only in tomorrow's mirror. You must be from Kenko. Yes, and this, this is... Most people use these beans for instant coffee. What are those? Uh, they're the best. We generally recommend those for ground coffee. Mmm, we'll buy all you have of these. What? For instant? At Kenko, we use beans for our instant coffee that we use for our ground. Hadn't I better clear that with the boss? You just have. Kenko, everything we know about coffee in an instant. <laughs> When the pressures of life push you close to breaking point. Canto Gregoriano. Canto Gregoriano. The Antidote. Something is missing from the Bodum electric kettle. There's no lead to get in the way. And it's yours for $29.95. For all the most up-to-date information on Carlton's programmes, with details on films and programmes up to a day in advance, there's a new teletext service called Carlton Plus, starting on page 600. Good evening, I'm Anna Maria Ash, this is London Tonight. First, a primary school teacher has been charged with cruelty to one of her pupils. It follows an incident earlier this month in which a child was allegedly bound and gagged in class. Annabel Hackney reports. The charge follows an investigation by the Met Child Protection Unit. The mother of seven-year-old Richard Inwood had complained to police and education chiefs after she found him in a distressed state. Richard is a pupil at Ramsden Primary School in Orpington. It's alleged that the teacher ordered another pupil to fetch a skipping rope and tie him to a chair because he was misbehaving. It's also alleged that he was gagged during the class. The teacher, Jill Basu, who's 50 and from Orpington, was tonight charged with cruelty. She'll appear before Bromley magistrates next month. She's already been suspended from Ramsden Primary School by the acting head teacher. In central London, this is Annabel Hackney, 
for London tonight. Other news, and a perfume saleswoman who said she got the sack because she was black has accepted a secret settlement from her former employers. Jacqueline Oliver from Brixton, who's on the left here, ran a perfume counter at top store Harvey Nichols for the French perfume company Givenchy. She claimed she was a victim of racial discrimination after being transferred to Debenhams in Oxford Street. At a tribunal in Croydon, she claimed she'd been told that her face didn't fit. Givenchy has denied the charge. A huge fire devastated a postal sorting office in East London today. Investigators are still trying to find out what caused the blaze at the Parcel Force depot in Canning Town. Sally Arthi reports. Fire crews have spent most of the day clearing up and damping down. The blaze erupted on the first floor of the massive sorting office in an area used to store empty mail bags. They thought the fire started over in that corner. The heat quickly blew out the windows and the breeze fanned the flames this way. Within minutes, this whole area was smoke logged. 100 firefighters were called to the depot in Canning Town just before 6 o'clock this morning. Within three hours, they had the blaze contained and under control. It's not yet clear how it started. The sorting office on the ground floor beneath the seat of the fire has been flooded. 80 staff were finishing off their night shift here when the blaze broke out. They were evacuated to safety when fire alarms went off automatically. Millions of pounds worth of parcels were piled up here waiting to be sorted. The depot handles 20,000 packages a day, but only a handful have been damaged. In Canning Town, this is Sally Arthi for London Tonight. The government is promising that London's famous red buses will stay red after privatisation. Stephen Norris, the Minister for Transport in London, said companies taking over central London routes won't be allowed to use their own colours. Ten companies now owned by London Buses Limited are to be privatised from April the 1st. Conditions at Wandsworth Jail in South London have been condemned as intolerable. The Board of Visitors say 250 remand prisoners in A-Wing live with slopping out, lack of showers and cockroach infestations. The prison service says plans to close the wing this year were put off because of increasing demands for cell space. Record-breaking London rower Peter Bird has revealed why he was forced to abandon his solo crossing of the Pacific Ocean. Mr Bird, who's from Fulham, said he ended the 10-month voyage after running out of food. He also capsized for the 26th time in treacherous seas, but he has set a record for the longest time spent at sea in a rowing boat. Now, the crown jewels have only been stolen once, and that was more than 300 years ago, but they're not taking any chances now. The Queen opened a new jewel house at the Tower of London today, complete with security systems approved by the SAS. Leon Hawthorne reports. A new home fit for a Queen and her jewels. I now have great pleasure in declaring the new jewel house open. It seems odd, but she doesn't see these jewels often. The coronation crown is worn once in the lifetime, the imperial crown only at the state opening of parliament. And there's a story behind every piece on display. Now we have the hall and the scepter. In the top of the scepter, we've got the largest diamond in the world, which is 530 carats. Next one is the little crown of Queen Victoria, which weighs four ounces only, which the queen used to wear on the back of the head, the bun crown. They expect two and a half million visitors each year. Security is an obvious concern. The SAS were brought in to advise on terrorist and theft control, and the Queen seems happy with the arrangements. The Crown Jewels now have a new home. This priceless collection of royal gems can now be seen in a modern, comfortable and secure setting by all. At the Tower of London, this is Leon Hawthorne for London Tonight. Football and it was a big day on the transfer market as this season's deadline passed. Queen's Park Rangers sold Darren Peacock to Newcastle for £2.7 million. That equals the British record for a defender. Everton beat Manchester City in the race to sign Anders Limpa from Arsenal. The Swedish international is on his way to Goodison for £1.6 million. And Clive Allen signed for his seventh different London club. Millwall have paid West Ham £75,000 for his services. And off the field, Jerry Francis, the Queen's Park Rangers manager, has signed a new one-year contract, ending speculation that he was about to take charge at Wolves. That's just about it, but coming up tomorrow on London Tonight, 12 British school children commit suicide every year because of bullying. It's a problem that affects 70% of children during their school lives. In a special report, we look at one Surrey school that's managed to cut bullying dramatically with a simple scheme involving pupils and teachers.
And we also have two exclusive interviews in showbiz, one with Julie Andrews and the other Bruce Forsyth. So do make sure you join us tomorrow night at 6. Until then, bye-bye. Hello. Well, we had quite a good day today, plenty of sunshine around. It was a bit breezy, though. Now, those strong winds are going to stay with us. That's staying the same, but the change comes with the weather itself. It's going to be quite wet tonight and wet start tomorrow morning. On the satellite photograph, we can see that it's been building up in the Atlantic, gradually streaming across to our part of the world. Nice and clear this afternoon, but that, of course, is all changing. This is what it's going to look like. The fir first of all, clouds coming in, then light rain and drizzle, but later on in the night, it's going to be quite heavy, that rain. It is going to be mild once again tonight the temperature is almost up to 50 that's nine in the city center you can see those winds are from the southwest and they're up to about 25 in the morning same sort of picture in the afternoon a slight improvement some sunshine those showers remaining <laughs>